good morning on this Sunday morning. A little bit rainy outside today, but, you know, again, it's it's another day where God's blessing us with his blessings to help the the, uh, the fields and to help us uh, enjoy the, the beauty of the greenery that's coming up for uh, this year. I know we're still not being able to, to be together, and it looks like probably... Um, sometime in this, towards the end of this month, we'll be able to start possibly meeting together, and we need to start thinking in those terms, but it's good to have you all um, tuning in and get to see me this morning. Um, I miss having you guys here. Uh, also, just a quick reminder, you know next week is Mother's Day, so don't forget that. As we get started this morning, what I'd like to do is go in and um, we are going to be talking about destined to be decisive in the decisions that we make. And we are going to be in that decisioning that we're going to be talking about is actually about integrity. You know, and a lot of people say, wow, that's a big word, or that's one of those words that we don't use very much. And it's unfortunate that we don't use it very much. Um, one of the presidents that we have a tendency to, to like quite a bit in this country was uh, Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan says that uh, in one of his quotes that integrity is one of the most important matters in a person's life. And as you continue on and you look at some of the other quotes that are going on out there, um, I found a slide screen and, uh, you know, actually, uh, as I was putting my notes together, I decided to put the pictures in there. You know, it's, that's one of the things that I really miss uh, having his Cal keeps, uh, will come up to me and say, David, you put pictures in it today. Well, Cal, I've got some pictures, but you have to go on online to find them, uh, you know, out of the, um, out of your emails, but they're there. The one that I have is, uh, it's talking about integrity. It said, simply let your yeses be yes and your noes be yo. no. Beyond, uh, anything beyond this is from the evil one, and that's actually quoted out of Matthew. You know, it's interesting, Hemingway actually made a statement that I thought was, was interesting when it comes to integrity. It says, before you act, listen. Before you react, think. Before you spend, earn. Before you criticize, wait. Before you pay, or before you pray, forgive. Before, uh, before you quit, try. That's a pretty good definition of integrity. And also, uh, one of the last ones that I found, one of the other uh, pictures that I found that, that I thought was interesting, is it says, integrity demands that I do what's right, even if it's unpleasant and unpopular. You know, so as we continue to look along those, in that framework, we know that integrity was a very big and powerful thing for God. Even when Satan came and asked to be able to test uh, Job, the one thing that, that God said, this is my man of integrity. And throughout, Job really stood up for the integrity that he had before God. What I'd like to do is go through just a few scriptures that are, you know, as we, we look, there's going to be some, uh, uh, some discourse on some discussion, some teaching that goes on in the Bible. And part of this comes from God. And it's actually quoted through different sources. You start off in, in um, 1 Kings 9, 4 through 5, it says, As for you, if you will walk before me as David, your father, walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, uh, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David, your father, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Here, God was speaking to Solomon, and he tells Solomon, if he says, if you come before me in integrity like your father did, like David did, he said, your throne will be lifted up. And Solomon did some really wonderful things, but he also got to a point that he started uh, from the women that he was marrying, and he had a big, uh, big entourage, that he started moving away from God. And then he also writes in Ecclesiastes that, you know, anything uh, other than go, uh, moving after God is like striving after the wind. So, you know, again, it comes back to integrity. It was because of some of the things that Solomon did that, and his sons that caused God to 
remove some of that statue of uh, the throne of David from, from uh, the, the uh, honors and accolades that it had. If you go down into Psalms, there's uh, three or four scriptures in Psalms that I think are pretty interesting. It says in Psalm 7, 8, the Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in, within me. That's from David. Here's another one of this. By this I know that uh, you delight in me. My enemies will not shout and triumph over me, but you have upheld me uh, because of my integrity and set me in, your pres in the presence before you. Blessed be the Lord of the God of Israel forever to ever to everlasting. Amen and amen. And then again in Psalms 101, uh, in verses 1 through 3, I will sing of loving kindness and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. And then in Proverbs, Solomon actually writes you know, a couple of places talking about um, integrity. And it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice and watching over the way of the saints. That's in 2, 6 through 8. And then he moves down into Proverbs 2, 20 to 21. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep the paths of righteousness. Uh, for, uh, for the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will re remain in it. And if you move into Proverbs 10, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who, who makes his way crooked will be found out. In 11.3, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroy them. In Proverbs 27, and also picking up verse 11, the righteous who, who walk in integrity, blessed are his children after him. Even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. And then lastly, when you get to... Uh, Proverbs 28, 18, whoever walks in integrity will be delivered, but he who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. See, now this is kind of the discourse that we get from God through those that were servants of his, that they realized how important integrity was to them. You know, you go in and you can read that whole book of Job, and it's all about his uh, Job's integrity before God. He said, no matter what you, uh, the, his friends were saying to him, his wife was saying to him, he says, I have integrity before God and I believe who God is. And what I've stated about God hasn't changed and it won't change. And he says, my integrity will always be before me. Same thing with David here. When you move into the New Testament, it's interesting. Jesus actually has a, a teaching or a discourse about integrity, which is in Matthew 5, 33 through 42. And he comes in and he says, and Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make uh, false vows and you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, no earth at all, either by heaven, for it's, it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstools of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statements be yes, yes, and no, no, anything beyond that is evil. You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the other to him. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have the coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. See, you know, here... Jesus is very plain. He said, you know, there's some things in, in the ancient teachings that you've been uh, raised with, which is talking about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And he says that we have to have our own impersonal integrity that allows us to stand up to the thing that the world uh, is trying to throw at us. And we have to stand before God in our personal integrity before him. 
If we have quoted ourselves as being Christians and we say that we are his children, that we need to be thinking more along the lines of the first and second commandments that we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our might, and we'd like to be loving our neighbors as ourselves. Within that neighbors as ourselves, he includes those that are enemies. And he says we've got to be willing to, when we make a stand, that our yes has to be a yes. It can't be in that gray area. Well, yes, unless something. No, that's not the way it is. Our no needs to be no. When we're talking to this world out there, when we say no, we have to mean it. We can't continue to say, well, no, I don't do that, except on special occasions. No, if we're going to be no, it needs to be no. If we're going to be yes, we need to be yes. And that's what he's trying to say here in this discourse on, on integrity. He said, we've got to be people that look different in the world because we have to be men and women of, of integrity. Go back to David. If we go into uh, Psalms 15, 1 through 5, it says, O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue, he do, uh, does nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friends, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Boy, is that a powerful promise. He said, if you are a man or a woman of integrity before God, he says, you can't be shaken from that. You know, so much of this world is shaken by the things that happen in their lives. And he says, that's not where we're at. That's not where we cannot be. Because when we are people of integrity, we have to be willing to take God at his, his word. And that's a promise that he makes. That if we follow in the ways that he has asked us to, if we walk in those paths, we don't start looking for opportunities to take things, to be able to abuse people, especially the poor. He said, when you're lending money, if you're lending money to somebody, lend it to them. But you don't charge them interest when they, when they do it. You lend it and you expect them to be people of integrity like you are, and to make restitution to what they've been lent. But we have to be willing to take the point that we are willing to do what God has set us out to do. Let's go on and move in, into uh, the discourse that we have with, uh, with Paul, the discussion that continues as Paul's writing, and he has four different places in Timothy that he actually talks about it. One is... is a long section of verses, but it's broken up into two, two discussions. Here in 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 14, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is granted to us in Christ Jesus for all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a, a preacher and an apostle and a teacher I catch this in verse 12 for this reason I also suffer these things but I am not ashamed for I know whom I believe and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him on, on until that day retain the sound um, words which have which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ, in Christ Jesus guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you so you know God is telling us here and Paul is saying you know my life has been dedicated to God yes I made a mistake at the beginning of my life but he said when I was confronted and 
got to see who Jesus really was, that he indeed was the Messiah. He said, from that point on, I have given up my life. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And he said, I've made that commitment. And he said, I stand strong in that. I'm convinced that he, he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him. And what I've entrusted to him is my very soul. Do we believe like Paul? That if we entrust our very soul to him, that he can guard it until the day that we're called home for the salvation that's promised to us? You know, see, that's what Paul here is talking about. He thinks it's important that, that uh, because of what Christ did, um, that we can be convinced that he's able to guard what we entrusted to him. And he, we have entrusted our belief. We've entrusted our faith. We've entrusted our love. And God is going to be able to, to uh, guard that because we have the Holy Spirit. He says, you will not be shaken. Okay, let's move down into the second of his, his discussions about this. In, in chapter 3 in, this, um, in 2 Timothy, it says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Woo! That one's a... Paul didn't pull any punches on that. Did you look at what he actually uh, described out there? It's not too far from what we see in this world out there. Hopefully it's not what we're seeing within this church and within the churches that claim to be of Christ. We as, as believers have to stand out. Our integrity and our love for God has to be so powerful that we can't be added into this list. If there's things in this list that we're doing that are not pleasing to God, and, it said, and God says that we need to avoid such men as this, he said we need to get away from that. As you continue on in the reading, he comes down and he says, For uh, among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sin and led by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he comes in and he talks about, uh, in eight, just as uh, Janus and Jambes opposed Moses, so those, these men also opposed the truth. Um, men of uh, depraved minds rejected in regard to their faith, but they will not uh, make further progress, for their folly will be observed to all, just as Jambes and, um, and Janus' folly was also. And then as you continue in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17, now you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, and suffering, just as happened to me in Antioch, and at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, out all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now catch 14. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. See, here he's talking to Timothy, but he's also talking to us. He's telling us that, you know, Timothy actually was very fortunate because his mother and his grandmother raised him to understand what the Holy Scriptures were. Most of us, you know, today... Um, are trying to, to emulate some of that same thing of knowing what the Holy Scriptures are. 
You know, we're trying to go in and see what it is that the Old Testament has to say, which leads us to what we do in the, in, in the New Testament today. You know, so as we continue to try and grow in that, he, he says we have to become men and women that are centered on, on knowing what the, the Word of God says. And we have to be learning and become convinced. See, this is where if we say, yes, I want to be a Christian. Yes, I want to, to die. And I want to be buried. And I want to be resurrected as a new creation. We have to be willing to stand by that statement from that point on in the, for the entire time until God calls us home. We can't be wishy-washy. We can't be in and then be out. We can't come in for a little while and get back out again. It's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week commitment to God. And that's one of the reasons we come on Sunday mornings is so we can let God know. And that's why we do these here. It says, do this in remembrance of me so we know what it is that God sent His Son to accomplish. That blood cleanses us and makes us holy again. But it's a commitment it's having to be uh, uh, people of integrity that want to show God what it is that changes their life. As you get down into, uh, into Timothy, he comes into 4, 1 through 8. And this is one, like I've told you before, is probably one of my most favorite verses in Timothy. But he comes in and he starts talking and he tells us, he says... I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Wanting to have their, their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. Catch five. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have, have loved his appearing. And here Timothy is being told by Paul, he says, look, I've done what I need to do to get myself right. Look, I've run this course I've finished it. I've done the things God has asked me to do to be pleasing to Him. My integrity stands before me, before God, and I'm convinced of that. And I'm convinced that what He promised, which is a crown that's going to be laid up for me in heaven, and also for all of those others who have the integrity and the foresight to be able to live pleasing to God, that they will have a crown just like are we there? Are we willing to say that we have those things that Paul is talking about? It's so important that as we come and we continue to look at the things that Paul has asked us to do, that we understand that um, there are going to be difficult times that are going to come. There's going to be times where we say, you know, God, why? But God's, like he told Paul, you know, when Paul was understood that he had this thorn in the flesh, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And essentially told Paul, he says, you need to stand in your integrity before me. I'm in control. I know what is supposed to be going on. I know where your heart's intent is. And I want you to be ready when I call you home. But that's going to entail us being people of integrity. It's going to entail that we show this world that we're different than what they are. We know what truth is. We know what honesty is. We know what compassion is. 
We know what integrity is. And we have to choose. It's a choice we get to make because God made us free thinkers. But it's also that we have to follow the commands that he has set down that say, this is the way that my kingdom needs to be established. Are we running that course? Are we finishing the race? Have we been poured out like a drink offering? Are we convinced enough to know that God is calling us? Thank you so much for this morning. This is the introductory, and we'll actually be picking up probably two or three more lessons on integrity. I hope this really starts you thinking about it. But I appreciate you uh, tuning in and coming to uh, be with us this morning. Thank you.